All right, now, this has nothing to do whatsoever with what the subject I'm preaching on this morning, but I just want to bring this up because we read Exodus chapter 21, and I'm so sick of the people that want to mock God's Word and that want to make fun of Christians and say, oh, you believe in this book, and don't you know that it says, you know, he that curseth his father his mother shall show you death. You know what? Yes, I do know that, and I believe 100% that this is the Word of God, and God's wisdom is way above any of man's wisdom, and I believe every single word to be true in this book. And if God has a certain judgment or a belief or a thought about something or says, this is wickedness and this deserves a death penalty, then you know what? I think God knows better than any man knows. Amen. And I am going to stand strong on this book. And don't you let people push you around and try to make you make excuses for what God's word says or try to backtrack you and try to make you feel ashamed of what the Bible actually says. We have no reason to be ashamed. Hey, if you're not ashamed to preach the gospel of Christ, you shouldn't be ashamed of any of his laws either. Amen. There is no reason to back down. If God says that someone that hits, that smites his father's mother shall be surely put to death, what does that say about how wicked of a sin that is for a son or a daughter to, to just actually go ahead and, and smack their, their father or their mother in the face? The total lack of respect. And God is big on the family structure. God is big on, on having respect for him first and foremost, of course. They're the first two commandments, not having any other God before him, not making any other graven images or anything, because our God is a jealous God, and he's a consuming fire. He says, I don't want you worshiping anybody else but me. And they have the total respect unto God. And he says, likewise, you as, as humans and, and your life, the father in your life, the mother in your life, you need to be treating them with respect. Amen. And he says, if you have so much disrespect and you're so rebellious that you're just going to go and punch your dad in the face, he says, that is wicked enough to deserve the death penalty. You know what? Amen and amen. amen. God's word is truth. Amen. Now, like I said, that's not what the sermon's about at all, but <laughs> we just read this whole thing out loud. And praise the Lord for it. His wisdom is, is much greater than, than any of ours. And I won't be pushed around with that. I will stand on every single word that this Bible has to say. But what we're doing tonight, I'm continuing on in a, in a series that I've been preaching on Sunday nights. And the series actually comes from Proverbs. We didn't read all Proverbs 6 because we've already done that in the past. And I don't want to just keep reading the same chapter over and over again um, every Sunday night. But in Proverbs 6, I'll just read this for you. Verse 16, the Bible says, These six things that the Lord hate. Yea, even seven, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. So the Bible says that those things, God hates all of those things. So what I've been doing is we've been picking apart one at a time. We've been going over each one that God hates and kind of going further in depth to just get a full understanding. Why is this so bad? Why does God hate? Why does God call it an abomination? The word abomination is not used lightly in the Bible. When God says that he hates something, he says this is an abomination, we better take notice to it. So when we see, and especially in this chapter, I've already gone over the lying. Lying's mentioned twice. It says these six things God hates, he hates seven are abomination. Lying is mentioned twice. Right. And lying is probably one of the easiest things for anybody to do, a sin that, that, that it's, it's easy just to lie to somebody about whatever. But I'm not going to preach about that. We already did that. We're, now this week, we have made it all the way to, um, there in verse 18, feet that be swift in running to mischief. And I'll be honest with you, this is probably one of the, one of the, the harder ones to preach on out of, out of all the groups that we're doing here. But um, the first thing that we need to understand when we, when we understand why is, uh, why is this so bad, feet that be swift in running to mischief, the word mischief, first of all, is kind of what, what comes to mind might be a little bit, di slightly different than what the Bible is using for the word mischief. Um, when I think of the word mischief, I just think of my grandmother back when like, I was a kid, like, you kids don't get into any mischief, right? And it's basically this meaning, don't get into any trouble. You know, don't, don't be doing anything you know you're not supposed to be doing. And it's not that that's a bad definition, but when you actually look at mischief in the Bible, it's a little bit more serious than that. There's, there's a lot more than just like kids kind of getting into 
innocent trouble or, or, or just being, you know, boys being boys or something like that. Mischief is actually um, a, a lot, you know, worse, a lot more um, comprehensive than that. And uh, there's, a, there's actually a few different usages of the word mischief in the Bible. And in preparing for the sermon, I went and looked up all the times that the word mischief's used just to get a really full understanding of what is the Bible talking about when it uses the word mischief and feet that are swift and running to mischief. So people are just dead set, they're ready to go at the first, uh, you know, when they wake up, their feet are swift, they're running to mischief. Uh, I'll read for you from Genesis chapter 42. Verse 38, Genesis 42, 38 says, And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So this is Israel talking about sending Benjamin with his brothers to uh, Pharaoh. When, when Joseph was in charge of things and there was the famine, Israel thought that Joseph was dead. He had, already, he had already been told that Joseph was dead, and he loved Joseph. Joseph was his favorite son, so he didn't want them to, to take Benjamin also because he's saying, look, if, you know, if something happens to Benjamin, basically if he ends up dying too when you take him with you, then I don't know what, you know, you're going to send my gray hairs down to the grave, like, just in sorrow. And... Um, so he says here, if mischief befall him, and that word mischief here is just talking about, well, if something really bad happens, if he ends up losing his life, nothing very descript, but basically the word mischief there is being used if something bad happens to him. Look at Exodus 21, where we started this, uh, this evening in verse number 22. It's a continuation of God's laws. We, we see a lot of examples and the punishments and the things that ought to be meted out for all these various crimes. And in Exodus 21, verse uh, chapter 21, verse 22, the Bible says, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. And it goes on and on. Now, this commandment, I just preached on this a few weeks ago. I was doing this whole sermon on abortion. And how the unborn child in the womb is alive, it's a life, it's a person. And we can see that very clearly from, the, from this chapter right here when, when the Bible is saying, look, basically what it's saying, if men are fighting, if they're striving, if they get in a fist fight, right, and maybe one of the men's wives is standing by and she, she tries to break up the fight, and in the course of them just swinging and punching, one of them, you know, knocks the, the pregnant wife in, in her womb. And as a result, the baby dies, right? But it was just an accident. He's saying, well, the guy who did it, he's going to be punished. But it's according as a woman's husband will lay upon him. And he shall pay. It's basically like a fine. It's, it's an, it, it was a, uh, like a manslaughter, right? It wasn't intentional. It wasn't trying to hurt the baby at all. But he did do it. And it was a result of, of their, I mean, they're fighting together. And, and, and that happened. But then it says, if any mischief follow then thou shalt give life for life. Why? Because the life of the child died. That's a life. That's a person. God views that as a person. He said, just as much as a murderer, thou shalt not kill. And any, and, you know, by, um, any man that, that, that killeth man by man shall his blood be shed. In God's law, if you're a murderer, the Bible says you ought to be put to death. That's just as much a life in the womb. If you intentionally try to kill that child in the womb, then you, the Bible's saying you deserve death. Right. You deserve the death penalty. And I believe that wholeheartedly. And I think that that's the standard we ought to have for people who want to have abortions and practice abortions today. Right. Is that they are right. murdering a child. Amen. But the usage of the word mischief here is a little bit different than what we read in Genesis 42. We see here, because mischief is saying if any mischief follow... And if, or if any mischief not follow. This is referring a little bit more to the intent, right? So it's saying if two men are fighting, but mischief follows, it's saying that he wanted to, to do that. He wanted to hurt her as opposed to it just being an accident. So it was more of a planned out thing. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 20. Tell him I'm not here. 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter number 20. We're going to see another example of the... Of the Usage of the word mischief. 
Because it's important when we're looking at, at, you know, why God hates these things, let's kind of get a, a good understanding of mischief and what it actually means. It's not that difficult of a concept, but we want to make sure we're getting a, a proper understanding. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse number 7. First Kings chapter 20, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. So this is talking about here, this king, he's saying, the king of Israel was approached and Basically, the, the, the other king was saying, you know, here's what I want you to do. And he came at him with an army. And he's saying, you give me you know, all this silver and all this treasure. You, know, you pay me off, basically, and I'll leave you alone. So he's like, okay, you can have it all. All, the, all this other stuff that you asked for. And then he comes back and says, oh, okay, well, that's not enough. Now I want even more. Now you can, and let me, let's, let's just read the story a little bit more in context here. Let's read up here. It started in verse number one. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered, just so you know what's going on here. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And they were 30 and two kings with him and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city and said unto them, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So he's saying, look, all your money and your children, you know, they belong to me. Thinking that, like, who's going to say, okay, yeah, they're all yours, right? Because he wasn't expecting that response. But Ahab just, just backs down. He's like, okay, yeah, that's all yours. Verse 5, And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall, sh shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. And he's saying, you know what? That's not enough. I'm going to just send my guys in there and just anything that they see, they're just going to go and just take it from you. Like we're just going to walk right into your house. We're going to go up. We're just going to take whatever we want. We own the place. We own you. And we're just going to do as we please. And verse 7 says, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold. And I denied him not. saying, Look, I answered him at the first time. Look, this guy's just looking to pick a fight, is what he's saying. And that's how he's seeking mischief. He doesn't really want all that stuff. He really just wants to conquer them and take them over. That was the whole point. And he had his heart set on mischief. He just wanted to cause trouble. He's out trying to cause a fight. And the Bible says that's one of the things that God hates. Is that feet that are swift to running to mischief where, you know, he's not satisfied with anything. He just wants to pick a fight. He's just out there trying to get people to fight with him. Now, I've noticed in many of the references to mischief that is referring to, to setting a trap for people, like trying to get them to, to fall or to stumble into some trap that they're, spending, that they're setting up or intending to do a specific evil unto them where it's planned out in advance. Like this guy, him just going to him and saying, messengers and saying, look, you're going to give me all your gold, all your children. Like, he already has it planned out. He was, already, he was thinking that he was going to say no way and that he'd have a war, he'd have a fight on his hands. He wasn't expecting them to come back and say, okay, yeah, it's yours. So he had to even, you know, raise it up a level and say, all right, fine, here's what we're going to do. And then at that, he did end up getting his fight. But um, most of the references here that when you go, because we're not going to go through them. There's, there's a lot of references in mischief in the Bible. And I think this is also the primary meaning of the verse in Proverbs, is the people who are setting up a trap, they're looking to do evil to somebody, and they're set on doing it. Now, this meaning is about a person basically conspiring to harm other people. And I think it's pretty funny these days in the media, when you hear about you know, the term conspiracy theorist and how it's just this complete derogatory meaning, you know, oh, you're just... You're one of those conspiracy theorists. And that's what the corporate media is going to try to tell you, that it's, oh, you don't have to listen to this person. It's, it's a way to just 
brush what they're saying aside. Oh, you're just some kook. You're just, you're just some conspiracy theorist. As if conspiracies don't exist and you're just coming up with some crazy things. Conspiracies are found all throughout the Bible. Right. And conspiracies are real in general anyways. I mean, all a conspiracy is is someone coming together with another person to do evil unto people. And that's it. I mean, it's, you, you, when you conspire with someone, you're making a plan, and then you're going to act out that plan. It's, it's not something that you have to just scoff at and say, oh, you, you crazy conspiracy theorist. One of, the, one of the things that's real funny, you know, people will say, uh, what's, what's a real common one? Like the 9-11, right? 9-11 was an inside job. You know what? I believe that whole, wholeheartedly. Amen. I believe that, that right. the, the truth is, you know, we've been lied to about some, some you know, Arabs in a, in a cave somewhere, you know, planned out this attack and, and brought down the Twin Towers. You could call me a conspiracy theorist all you want, but when you look at the evidence... And when you look at the, the lack of evidence for the story that was put out by the, by the government, by our you know, wonderful, godly, Christian government that only has our best interests at heart, well, wait, is that, is that not the way it is? Is our government not run by crooks and criminals? But when you look at the evidence, it point, you know, there's, just, there's too many questions. There's too much fact, there's too much video, there's too much evidence out there to show that the, the, the story that they put out does not match up and I'm not going to go into the big thing about 9-11. Like, look it up for yourself. The point is that people in charge, the, the, the wickedness in high places, they, want, they don't want people finding out the truth about anything. Regardless, I mean, this, this want to keep people in the dark, and especially if it's going to shine a light on their wickedness. And the corporate media these days, that's why I, I don't get any of my information from, from these, these corporate-run media outlets because... They work for their bosses, and their bosses have their hands in a lot of different, in a lot of different pockets, and they have a lot of power. And um, our media today is, is by and large, it's, it's run by the Jews for the most part. And I'm sure, even in the, in the, in the Bible days, that the Jews that would have loved to control the media the way that they do today during the time of Jesus... You know, they would have loved to have that same control and to convince people that they were not conspiring to kill him. Because when you read all throughout the New Testament, who was it that was trying to catch Jesus in his words and they were trying to go about to kill him? It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and it was the chief rulers of the Jews. And that they were trying to kill Jesus. And they did. They ended up succeeding in that. But they were conspiring. They made a conspiracy. They planned together, saying, well, how are we going to trap him? How are we going to catch him? And then finally, the traitor Judas came forward and says, I'll, I'll, I'll betray Jesus. I'll lead you unto him. I'll, I'll you know, bear false witness against him or whatever. And uh, they did. But wouldn't it have been nice for them to be able to just sway all the people to just say, no, we actually like him when they're really plotting to kill him. They did the same thing with Paul. In Acts chapter 23, the Bible reads in verse 12, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. So there's this one example of the Bible talking about a conspiracy that's made. So... Don't, don't let yourself be brainwashed by the, by the modern media just trying to make it. Anytime you hear a conspiracy, well, you, this person must just be a kook. Now, I'm also not saying that every single conspiracy you ever hear about is true. <laughs> right? Of course, that would be ridiculous. But you need to weigh the evidence and look at the facts. And don't just let someone, because someone wants to put a derogatory term on it, oh, you must just be some crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist. You know, that doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just, it's just a way for them to avoid answering the really tough questions and looking into something themselves where you just brush it off. Oh, you're just some conspiracy theorist. There's conspiracies made all the time. The Bible has a lot of references to people who make conspiracies. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 94. This is tied in, by the way, with the conspiracies because the people who run to, to shed blood are, are the same as the people who are, are swift to, uh, to causing mischief. Because the mischief that they cause, and we, we find this all throughout the Bible and in most of the references of the word mischief, 
it's planned out. It's not just by accident. We, we saw if no mischief follow in, in Exodus, where we started off reading, if it's not mischief, it wasn't planned. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't intended. But if it was intended, then that is mischief. And if people are intending to do evil, then it's, it's, it's planned out. It's a, it's a conspiracy. It's, it's people conspiring to do wicked unto others. And as I've mentioned time and time again as we go through this, we need to understand as Bible believers that there are wicked people out there in this world. And it's foreign to most of us to think that somebody is out there trying to just intent on doing evil to people and doing harm to people because your average person isn't like that. They're not just out trying to, to harm somebody. They're not out, you know, just, just seeing how can I hurt somebody. That is not the common person. But just because it's not the common person doesn't mean these people don't exist. And we need to be aware of it so that you can be on, you know, just be vigilant. Be diligent in your understanding of this stuff so that you don't, uh, you don't get, fall into the traps that they're trying to lay for you. Look at Psalm 94, verse number 20. Psalm 94 and verse number 20. The Bible reads, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. This is talking about people like the throne of iniquity. A throne is a, is a position of power, right? The throne of iniquity, iniquity is sin, have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. So they're using the laws of the government in order to, to perform their mischief. Right. See, they don't want the mischief that they're doing to be against the law. They want to keep doing it. And the first thing that comes to my mind every single time I read this verse is our abortion laws yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have the wicked people of this world that want to use it. They frame mischief against the innocent, unborn child, and they use a law to do it. They say, well, it's legal now. So it's just accepted, and we can do whatever, we can do whatever mischief we want now to these unborn children. And it says in verse 21, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. And what blood is more innocent than a child? Right. And, but this is the way that the, these workers of iniquity, these wicked people operate. They will do whatever it takes. They're going to frame their mischief by law. They have it set in their mind that they want to do evil to people. And they get into the positions of power. They get into these positions of government because then they could try to change the laws. Change the laws of the land. I don't trust the politicians. I don't think we have any reason to trust them. They've showed us that they're, they're all wicked, they're all corrupt, and uh, they're all out of the way. That's right. These people whose feet are swift and running to mischief are evil people. That's why God hates them. That's why God says it's an abomination. Instead of having their heart set on helping people and doing good unto others and you know, loving your neighbor as yourself, they want to hurt people. They want to cause destruction and damage. And look, these people exist. They're out there. People are not just generally good. Like a lot of people have this, this concept that, well, people are just generally good. No, I mean, you've got you to look out for these people. That's why you have these, these child molesters and these predators that, that can get away with their crimes is because people, oh, they're, that's a great person. They would never do something like that. And inside, they're wicked. And, and people have too much trust these days on just trusting anybody. I'll tell you what, I don't trust anybody with our children. I trust my wife, of course. <laughs> I better trust my wife with my children. But, um, and maybe like, like our, our parents, our, the people who raised us up and we know them really well, our own immediate personal family, I will trust them, and I only trust them to a point anyways, because my children are precious, and I don't want anybody, you know, the, the people oftentimes that are, that are um, defiling these children, they end up being relatives. Yeah. They end up being the uncle. They end up being the cousin. They end up being somebody that you think you can trust. And inside, they're wicked, and they're set on doing mischief. And that's why these wicked people will, will try to get positions to where they can be trusted. Because they already have a plan to defile the innocent blood. They have a plan to go after people. So what do they do? One of the biggest places they'll come to is churches. Yeah. 
Because of all the places in the world, if you think you could go somewhere and be safe and be around good people, where do you think you're going to go? To church, right? To where people are worshiping God and they love God. Of course you think you're going to be going to a place where everyone around you is great. But they're infiltrators. They, they're, they're wolves in sheep's clothing. That's why they put on the outward appearance. They may be able to say, oh, hey, nice to see you, brother. They could talk the talk. But in their heart, they're devising mischief. And they're just seeking out their opportunity to destroy the innocent blood. And we got to be aware of these people. And that's, you know, that's, there's many of the reasons why we do things the way we do here. This is a family integrated church. We don't have people going behind closed doors. We don't have the opportunity for the pedophile, the pervert, to go and take our kids away and defile them. And I think that we, as parents, Individually, you ought to make some rules for yourself and make sure that your kids aren't left out of your sight to where they can get, the, uh, the, these, these perverts can get their hands on them and defile them also because these people exist, they're set on mischief and they're looking to do harm and they will plan and plot it out. They're extremely wicked. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 4. We went over this just last week in our, in our uh, Proverbs study, but I think it's pertinent to bring up again tonight. The more we look at these verses just regarding mischief and people are set on doing evil, it's a lot easier to understand why God hates all these things that are mentioned in, in, in Proverbs chapter 6 and how extremely wicked they are. And it, you know, we, we need to be able to wrap our mind around it that these people are out there and, and God hates it and we ought not to be tolerant of it. It's not something you should have a soft spot for. Again, this world's going to try to tell you, oh, no. And you, know, you know what the newest thing is I saw? And, and I, I would like to say it's shocking, but the way things have gone these days, it's like nothing can shock me anymore. The newest thing I saw by the, by the, the propaganda, the liberal propaganda, the, the wicked satanic propaganda being pushed these days now, is the, one of the newest things I saw was trying to explain a pedophile. Literally, you're trying to say how, oh, it's just another preference. See, they got you to accept that the queers, that the faggots, that the homos, that that's just a, a preference. That that's just an alternate lifestyle. See, it used to just be rejected out of hand and, of course, saying that's sick, that's perverted, that's yeah, disgusting. That's right. that's, it's, it's weird. It's, we it's queer. Right. We're not going to have anything to do with that. Amen. But they've got you to accept that. They've got you to think that that's normal, that that's okay. It's just, it's just an alternate lifestyle. So now they've moved on because they're not going to be content with letting you sit at that. Right. You know, they fight for their stupid marriages and now they're coming out and saying that, oh, here's a person, and they, and they write this big article I saw where they're trying to explain how, oh, here's this poor guy. He's just attracted to little children. He's attracted to little girls. Now, he hasn't defiled any of them, you know. He had to move away because, but he just has, he, he was born that way. That's just his attraction. It's wicked as hell. And this is, this is the propaganda. This is what they're trying to get you to accept these days. And it's going to continue down the filth hole of, of, you know, the pedophilia, the bestiality, just to, to bizarre, to no end. Right. And this is what's being shoved down your throat by the people who are set on doing mischief. It's a plan. That's right. It's a planned attack. And by this vocal, wicked minority, because the people who actually believe God's word, they're not standing up. The pastors of churches these days, they're not, they're not sounding the alarm like they should have been decades ago. And, and calling out this stuff and saying, we're not going to tolerate this stuff. I know you're preaching tolerance. I'm not preaching tolerance. Amen. Right. See, we're not going to have anything to do with this garbage. I want my children to, to grow up in a, in a society where they don't have to be worried about these perverts around every corner. I want them to at least be able to grow up in, a, in an era that I grew up in where I was still able to go out and play with my friends down the street and not have to worry about someone just, just picking me up off the street and taking me away somewhere and abusing me. But like that seems to be the world we're headed towards and are in today. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 13. It's a shorter sermon tonight. Acts chapter 13. It's the last place we're going to turn.
these wicked reprobates are set on destruction and they're, they stand for everything that's against God. And we're going to see an example of someone like that, this reprobate in the Bible. In Acts chapter 13, his name was Elymas. Acts chapter 13, verse number 8. The Bible says, But Elymas the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? So he's talking to this guy in the context of this story. There's this deputy, Sergius Paulus, and he wanted to hear the word of God. Barnabas and Saul were there, and he's saying, you know what? I want to hear the word of God. I want to know what this is all about. So he's calling for them, but this reprobate Elymas, he's preventing them from, he's, he's trying to prevent this guy basically from getting saved. He doesn't want him to hear the word of God. He's trying to hide the truth. He's trying to make sure that he doesn't get saved. So he's withstanding them. So Paul confronts him about it. And he says, he's filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's full of boldness. And he sets his eyes on him, and he says, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. See, he's full of all mischief because he's trying to prevent this guy from getting saved. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? See, this guy's out there making a perversion out of God's word. Elemis the sorcerer. There's plenty of people out there today that are doing the same exact thing. They tamper with God's word. They try to, to, to say that, oh, you know, God loves all this wickedness and this sin and God loves everybody and everybody welcome here and all this other nonsense. They're full of subtlety and they're full of all mischief. It's a greater plan that's out there of, that, that ultimately Satan is behind. And that's why he calls them a child of the devil. Watch out for the children of the devil that are out there today, that are full of mischief, that are trying to get you to accept the garbage and the filth that they're, that, and the perversion that they're promoting these days. My prayer is that everybody in this church can stand firm on God's holy word. This book doesn't change. The times change a lot. The times change, and, and even in my short lifetime, I'm 39 years old. In the short few decades I've been alive, this world has changed yeah. dramatically. Yeah. Dramatically. This book is still the same. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that, and I will stand on this book, and we need to shout on the rooftops against the encroaching wickedness that is in this society but we need to watch out for the people that have that are whose feet are swift to mischief Amen. let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer dear Heavenly Father Lord we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom that you have Lord help us to have the same heart that you do dear Lord that we don't just become tolerant of all the sin and wickedness that they're abominable unto us just like they are unto you dear Lord these people whose feet are swift to running to mischief and all of the other six things that you hate dear God help us to have the proper heart to where we hate those things also to where we have a similar heart to yours Lord, hating in general is not wrong. We need to be hating wickedness. We need to be hating the sin. We need to love people and preach to them the gospel. But Lord, help us to just hate all this wickedness and these wicked doers, these reprobates that just don't cease to pervert the, the, the word of God. Dear Lord, help us to have the proper balance in our life and help us to warn other people and, and to help us to be safe from these people who are set on running to mischief. Dear Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.